So um, I, I'm sort of a, a Skip Masbax in one of the hats that he wears, a boss of his, right? And I think he's hired me to speak here uh, kind of as a, 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 as a courtesy, and I hope it won't be a terrible disappointment to, to you. He had to have me, have me come and speak. And for you, to, you can know that he had to do that uh, because I have zero knowledge about youth ministry uh, and have never done any of it. Uh, and I'm totally scratching my head as to what to do with my 14-year-old uh, son, who is a saint on top of it, right? <laughs> Let alone if he had a, some uh, difficulty facing us. But um, um, I'm, I'm still delighted to, to be here with you and talk about something that's really I'm passionate about. Uh, I teach uh, here at Yale, but often I don't speak about things and teach about things that I'm really passionate about. And I know some of my former, no, some of my students who had heard me speak um, have come here and asked me, why don't you speak about the stuff we've heard you speak when you were in this church or that church uh, out there? Um, and. Uh, well, maybe that's this one speech that I <laughs> have a chance to, uh, to give to you. And uh, it is connected, as Skip has mentioned, uh, with this program of God and human, on God and human flourishing. And I'm delighted, really, that uh, connected with this program on God and human flourishing, uh, we have a, a adolescent faith and flourishing program at the center. I really do think, even though I know very little about uh, youth ministry, I really do think that uh, on the one hand, kind of the experiences of adolescence in uh, our culture are indicative of where culture finds itself today, probably to the degree that very little else is. And I think that the possibilities also in terms of youth uh, and adolescents, uh, in terms of them catching a vision of alternative way of life, are also extraordinary. And uh, it has been one of my great, uh, great privileges uh, being hanging around this place at Yale to have come to know Skip, who is on the advisory board of the uh, of the uh, of uh, both Yale Center for Faith and Culture, but also Divinity School, and who has had sufficient wisdom as a senior minister of a very prominent church to make youth ministry the very center of what he does. I know very few ministers who do that, and uh, they should learn, I think, uh, from him. And I hope that if anything else happens here during this, has happened here during this time that uh, you've had the with Skip and uh, this whole iteration of the connection between BDS and the Yale Center for Faith and Culture and Youth Ministry Program is for you to uh, kind of catch a glimpse of a vision of what it could be. It's absolutely, I think, um, extraordinary. And I speak as, um, also as a father, <laughs> um, but also as the one who observes culture, who observes uh, the churches. And um, hopefully we can do something about that very important uh, um, question of the crisis of adolescence and see this uh, not only as a kind of band-aid uh, activity, but as a true opportunity uh, to make something extraordinary. So, um, but I will talk less about uh, youth ministry and something that I think uh, kind of underpins the ministry as, as a whole. And... Um, uh, it's one of my, has been one of my passions over the years, and uh, God and Human Flourishing Project is connected uh, with this. And this is that I thought for a while now that we are losing ability to think in our culture as a whole, but also in our churches and our academic institutions, we're losing the ability to think adequately and reflect deeply about the purposes of human life, about the question of meaning of life. And you can kind of uh, think of it uh, maybe this way. You step back and look at, uh, at one week of your life, or you can look at one month of your life, and then you say to yourself, well, you know, some of the stuff that I do um, falls in the category of means, and some of the stuff that I do <laughs> and chunks of time that I spend falls in the category of ends. Means are that 
which I engage in so that I can be engaged in things that I really want to be <laughs> engaged in. Uh, and all of our lives are organized around means and ends of this sort. And often we need to ask ourselves, uh, well, what is it that actually is the end and the goal of activities that we undertake? Um, when I was... Uh, on a research leave at the University of Tübingen, and um, I had a, a short walk of some 15 minutes from the place where I lived to Theologicum, which was the divinity school of the University of Tübingen, and where I had an office where I worked uh, every day. And in the middle of that walk, uh, I had to pass, uh, or I chose to pass, through a graveyard. And at the beginning of the graveyard, there was a large tombstone. And on that tombstone, high tombstone, was the tombstone of family Goes. And it has uh, Frederick Goes, Henrietta, Henrietta Goes, and then My Michael Goes. And then as I was passing by, I was reading this, um, this, uh, this uh, last name uh, in English. And Goes is spelled G-O-E-S. So I would read Frederick Goes. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Goes. <laughs> Harrietta Goes. And then I would add, and we all go. <laughs> and then I would walk down. And that was at the beginning of... Uh, I walked down the, the, the hill. At the very tail end, uh, just about to exit the graveyard, was a tombstone to one of the great theologians of the 19th century, Ferdinand Christian Bauer. Uh, and then served as a kind of occasion for me to kind of place my whole work, day's work before my imagined uh, end, and then to ask the question, well, what is the end of this day's activity? What is the purpose? of this day's uh, activity. And um, it is this ends and means that we often, uh, often, uh, often uh, kind of a reflection that we hopefully often engage uh, in. And then the question for us is, well, um, how often do we ask the question of ends? Or have the means, so to speak, usurped all of our uh, energies and activities so that we almost follow as if in a stream uh, pushing through doing what we are supposed to do and often losing from sight what truly is it that we are trying to achieve what the purposes of this particular activity is and then broader speaking what is the purpose of our lives as a whole you can put this question slightly differently and say, well, we often um, ask the question as to what does it take for us to succeed in this or that endeavor, and we place a lot of energy into succeeding, uh, making sure that all the steps are made so that we will succeed and uh, bring a particular endeavor to a happy ending, but often we fail to ask the question, what does it take for us to succeed as human beings? Not what does it succeed simply uh, take to succeed here and there and this in this or that. Whether that's education, whether that's job that we have, but what does it take in all of this? And what does it mean, not just what does it take, but what does it mean to succeed as a human being? Now, the reason why we often fail to ask this most important of all questions, and if there is a question for human beings to answer, which is at the bottom of all questions, this is the question that needs to be answered. If there is an endeavor to undertake, then this is the endeavor to undertake, to succeed as a human being. And if you don't ask that question, it's partly because we are so incredibly busy, but it's partly because I think we operate on something like a default understanding of what our lives are often for. 
And that default understanding is carried on the wings, very powerful wings of culture, and I think uh, um, partly also on, on the wings of uh, kind of a, a turbo market economy in which we, uh, in which we uh, live. And the default account of what it means for us to lead a flourishing life is, I think we live in a culture of managed pursuit of pleasure. <laughs> Give me more! <laughs> um, so pleasure, it is in a pleasure, it can be in a, in a vi wide variety of forms. It can be all the way from delights of uh, classical music to the smells of great wine to the pleasures of sadomasochistic sex and everything in between. What matters and that's the crucial point, is not the content of the pleasure, but the pleasurableness of pleasure for us. So that ultimately the arbiter then is our own authentic experience of pleasure. And it's managed pursuit. It's not just any pursuit of pleasure. We're not so dumb. <laughs> in pursuing. We're not very smart either, but, <laughs> but we're not, not very dumb either, right? It's a kind of managed pursuit. We want to make sure that uh, this pressure kind of lasts, that it has a kind of longevity, that it isn't terribly undermining various aspects of our lives, so we manage it, right? We manage our health, we manage uh, whatever it needs to be managed so that we kind of succeed in, in, in this experience of pleasure in a bit of more complex way than just, uh, you know, uh, let's eat and drink uh, for tomorrow, we will die. So it's a managed pursuit of pleasure. Um, that's a kind of default uh, position that we have. But we rarely ask the question, well, how do you set this account this default account of our purpose of our life within the larger perspective of what it means to be a human being, live as a human being, and succeed as a human being. And one of the reasons why we don't ask this question is because increasingly we have come to believe in the culture that there isn't such a thing as a human nature. Uh, instead, we think in terms of authenticity of our experience. <coughs> it means there are particular individuals, we as individuals, and each of us has our own particular destiny. <laughs> each of us has own particular self, right? And we have to be authentic <laughs> with regard to the character of this self, and the, our big challenge is to find our authenticity, right? What is authentic? And big sin that we commit is the sin against authenticity. Right? Because then we've kind of betrayed ourselves, our own specific selves. But we tend not to think in terms of that there is such a thing as a human nature. So that it's not just enough for us to be authentically true to ourselves, but it's also important for us to be true to who we are qua human beings, right? So we can find ourselves in a situation, at least from the from perspective of, of, of the classical Christian tradition, where we might gain the whole world, right? <laughs> but in the process, lose our soul. And I think we may fulfill our authentic longings, if you want, in terms of our authenticity, but fail as a human being, as human being. There may be this discrepancy. And I think it's very important for us to then try to kind of figure out ways in which we can reflect on the proper ends of us as human beings. Now, you might think that universities would be just about the right places where one might think about the proper ends of human beings. And indeed, it used to be the case 
uh, that this was what universities and colleges were for. Some of you, I hope most of you, have uh, read, consulted uh, a book that I think is very important uh, um, by Tony Cronman. It's called Education's End on why American colleges and universities have given up on the meaning of life. Tony Cronman, by the way, is a sterling professor of law uh, right here um, in, in, our, in our neighborhood. The book itself is, I think, very important because he sketches the development or devolution <laughs> uh, from his perspective and from my perspective, devolution of our colleges and universities from the point where uh, the question of the meaning of life was at the very heart of the university endeavor. End of 19th century, beginning of 20th century, um, universities were organized around the question of meaning of life. Presidents of universities used to give whole courses on the meaning of life. And once they got less time to give whole courses, they addressed the whole student body with, uh, uh, with talks about the meaning of life because reflecting on, uh, intelligently on, an account of life well lived was what university training or college training was all about. For examined, unexamined life is not worth living, right? The, the whole tradition going from Socrates, Socrates and, and on. And as it turned out, uh, 80s and 90s on, the question of the meaning of life has disappeared, virtually disappeared from uh, the interest and from the university curriculum. And the Tony Cronman's book is about tracing the reasons why that is the case. And then Tony, uh, who is an atheist, uh, is trying to come up with, an, with, with a way in which to put back the question of the meaning of life and pursue it with, uh, with, with robust interest uh, into the, uh, into the um, um, college, college curriculum. Two reasons, he says, uh, therefore why uh, colleges, American colleges and universities have given up on the meaning of life. One is the persistent uh, and uh, um, kind of spread of hard sciences. Uh, and, uh, and they're spread into, into wide domains of, uh, of, of, of human, uh, human knowledge. Um, and sciences do not ask the purpose question, they're explanatory endeavors, right? So, and therefore the why question, the purpose question, is not asked by them. Now this is not a, uh, the, 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 the expansion of sciences by itself, I don't think is to be also celebrated, right? That we understand the larger portion of reality in a much better, better way. So this in and of itself is not an, not an issue, but rather that in terms of what the university does as a whole, the end questions of meaning of life uh, end up squeezed out. Uh, they have kind of been then pushed, uh, as humanity has, has been pushed so uh, and squeezed, so also has this question been squeezed within the humanities. And then um, various reasons, and I'm not sure that I'm, I agree with Tony Cronin, why this has happened. I think he, he blames multiculturalism, but I'm not sure that multiculturalism is to be, be blamed for it. Um, but what I think is, is going on is that the multiculturalism uh, forms of it can be a symptom of it. We'll, we'll talk about it. I know some of you have pushed the button. So, <laughs> for some of you, for some of you uh, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, take, it, to take, take it on. Um, but but his point is, uh, point of this, this, I think the, the reason for it is, is, is fallacious, but the point is, is correct. And his point is, is this, that uh, alternative are forms of life, uh, ways in which one understands life, have, let's leave the, the reasons why, for whatever a variety of reasons, has, have become more or less forms of preference and not kind of thought through accounts of life that have been placed into conversation with one another. So if I tell you I don't like to wear 
uh, jackets anymore, and I really like my socks, right? <laughs> Uh, with stripes uh, there, and I'm tired of wearing black socks or gray socks with gray with gray suit. Uh, you say, well, that's great, you know, uh, you like that, but uh, I I don't particularly care for it. I prefer to dress some, something else. And there's really no discussion between us to happen. I respect your choice, and you will presumably respect my choice. It won't offend it might be offended by my socks, but might think that they're cool. Uh, and, and then that that's that's it. You prefer pizza, and I prefer Thai, uh, thai chicken uh, dishes, and there's nothing to discuss about the, the, the issue, right? It's simply an aesthetic preference. Right? Now, if you think that all accounts of living well are just such similar preferences, uh, then there's nothing to discuss about them within the context of a university curriculum, right? They're not matters of truth. They're matters of my simple preference. A sociologist might want to discuss them and figure out why is it that shifts are happening and the preferences are moving this or that direction. A psychologist uh, might, might well, from a certain angle, discuss them, but they will not be matters of truth play, of needing to be examined as forms of life, compared, contrasted, argued about. And some people might say, but well, this is a good thing. We don't argue about alternative ways of life, right? But I think that means the motion of alternative modes of life to just that, a simple preferences. And of course, it's not the case that if we have simple preferences of accounts of life, that they won't clash. It's just that they're going to be clashing without us being able to discuss them. In an intelligent way, they would not be a matter of public discourse, intelligent public discourse, they will be simple, simple clashes. Because partly we haven't learned how to discourse, how to discuss alternative way, ways of life uh, in the context of our education, because we think there are simple preferences, simple preferences. So, combination of this account of alternative accounts of life, whether you're Buddhist, whether you're Muslim, whether you're a Christian, whether you are whatever you want to name, right? They're simple, simple preferences. But, but, but part of the account of them is, is preferences. And then the absence of a sense that there is such a thing as a human nature. You combine these two together, and you find that you, at the university level, can no longer discuss meaningfully the question of what it means to lead one's life well. What does it mean to succeed as a human being? Right. It comes slips up. Now, you might think that places like divinity schools uh, <laughs> might be places where you can still discuss those things in those terms of can, or this would be the most hospitable kind of a place to discuss that question. And I thought, aha, that's very, very interesting. Tony, come to the Divinity School, and you'll see that we do those things. But then I thought about what we do here at the Divinity School. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, oh. Um, Does it add up? I'll ask you. Does it add up to conversation about what it means to lead one's life well and what are alternative competing accounts and why we ought to choose one way of life rather than another? I don't think it does. Um, Historically, historical studies that we engage in often do not raise those, they raise all sorts of interesting questions, but not that question. Um, systematic theology that I teach, <laughs> well, I try, but often it doesn't raise sufficiently, with sufficient force, that question. And yet tomorrow, if you go and are a public intellectual um, working, working for some NGO, or if you go and stand behind the pulpit and preach, how will you speak unless you speak out of uh, an account of what it means to lead one's life? Well, this is, I would say, for, for a minister, for a theologian, this is 
This is like, like knowing your ABCs. <laughs> <laughs> and it will be a matter simply of, you know, how do I then connect <coughs> this particular situation in which we find ourselves to the vision of leading one's life well? But account of what it means to lead one's life well, while well, recognizing, of course, that there may be plurality of these accounts because we live in a pluralistic society, but nonetheless, an account of what it means to lead one's life well should be bread and butter of what we, who we are and what we are equipped with. And yet we don't raise those questions. The most important question. We stutter when we try to speak of them. Now, you might think, OK, divinity schools have been corrupted by academia, you know, by professors who pursue their own interests rather than kind of zeroing in at, at the very heart of or the heartbeat of what, uh, what, what curriculum should be about. But if we go to churches, we'd find places there where you can raise these kinds of questions. And indeed, if you read Tony Cronman's book, at one point toward the end, he said, uh, since the question of meaning of life has migrated away from the university, the only places where you can find discussion of the meaning of life is really you have to go to churches. <laughs> <laughs> You're an atheist Jew. <laughs> and it shows. <laughs> when have you been last time in the church? And if you went to churches, you'd find that this is not a question that's being discussed. In fact, I would say that today in the churches, majority of the churches, are to take the terminology from the begin introductory comments that I made. They are about the means, and then we are not about the ends. We are about the means, how to achieve the ends that we already know that we want to achieve. And then you need a little bit of spiritual push. Or you need a little band-aid because you bruised yourself as you were trying to achieve your ends. I call this um, a kind of band-aid religion. Or, in other cases, religion is a performance-enhancing drug. So you need to succeed in whatever you decide that you need to succeed. Hail Mary passes, right? You pray. Um, and, and religion is functionalized with regard to the ends that we ourselves are setting and that we ourselves are pursuing. Now, corresponding to this account of religion and what happens in the churches is the account of God that we have often in the churches. And Christian Smith has done this study, uh, I think it's a mainly, in the, this study was about evangelical uh, calls and uh, students in evangelical colleges, how they understand uh, what, what the image of God uh, is in which they operate. And basically, these are now my, my terms, and I think I'm, I'm a little bit distorting his, uh, his, his uh, more complex position, but roughly it ends up being that the image of God is that of a heavenly butler. <laughs> Busters are great things. <laughs> I really want one. <laughs> I think every human being should have one. Um, but the purpose of Butler is right, is utterly subservient to your end. He or she stands at the door, hopefully hears nothing, sees nothing, unless you call upon a butler, and then, lo and behold, delivered to you is your wish, and then he or she retreats, not facing you with his or her back, uh, and stays in the court. Your purpose is matter. He's there to deliver means of your achieving your purpose. And so, I think in many of our imagination, we have functionalized God. 
Now, when you stop and think about it, um, well, that's exactly what the critics of religion is always saying. <laughs> that's what the Marxists of this world, that's what the Freuds of this world, that's what uh, uh, down the line Nietzsche's of this world have always played. Religion is there to serve your purposes. It has a function. And that function is connected with your goals, individual goals, social goals, uh, human uh, nature kind of goals, but they are completely functionalized with regard to uh, your goals. God is not an independent thing there. And of course, if that is the case, means dominate and ends become unreflected one more time under the guise of religion. But religions, Christian faith, certainly, is fundamentally, I think, well, it's fundamentally about God, but it's fundamentally when it comes to nature, human beings, it's about who the self is. What is the nature of social relations? And what is the good that we pursue? And so it's an account of the world and us situated in the world. And what are the goods we ought to be pursuing and how we ought to pursue them? That's in the most abstract. Now, now, now the helicopter is at about 15,000 feet, right? When I put it in those terms. But you have to put it in those terms in order to realize that really the question of purposes, question of meaning, question of account of what, the, what, what human beings ought to be and how they ought to live, that's at the heart of the discussion of, of religion. And that's why I think there's such strong passion um, around the question of, of faith, the question of religion. For instance, the question of um, <coughs> The, the, the big public debates, right, in, especially in relationship between Islam and Christianity, uh, are often concerns women's bodies. But they're not about covering. They're about what it means to be female <laughs> and what the role of woman is in the society. Right? It will be easy if, we, if they were about covering one's head, but they're not about that. They're about something much deeper because it, it contains an account of a self and social relations, right? And that's why they generate such immense passion, and especially women's bodies, because it has to, be, it has to deal with reproduction of the society. It's a whole, whole complicated set of things that has to do with deep questions of human uh, interaction, human nature. That's why those questions are so important. Um, all this uh, is to say simply that I think we will do well if we would step back as theologians and try to um, give ourselves, for ourselves, an account of what it means to flourish as a human being, succeed as a human being. And then it comes obviously to the questions of um, adolescent faith, of youth programs. There of all places. <laughs> this ought to be the fundamental question. This is a transitional period, right? Period when, when, when all transmitted certainties and ways of life are being questioned and, uh, and, and, and doubted. When new forms of identifications are being, being formed. When I am finding who I am as myself, um, or I'm over against and opposed to the parents which have given me, uh, have raised me. This is the place where these questions are alive. At least they were when I was growing up. Uh, and are becoming alive when I observe uh, students uh, and uh, kids, uh, kids otherwise. Uh, that has to be a fundamental uh, question. And hence, again, rather than thinking of the youth ministry also as a way of kind of managing means, right? Managing young people, helping them con be, be conduits to whatever goals they've set for themselves or their parents have imposed upon them and we kind of keep them uh, somehow patched up together in this transitional period. It's a great time for discovery. 
I mean, you know, I, I mean, personal, if you want a testimony, after, after migrating away from, from faith, I found my way back when I was 15 and a half. <laughs> it was a great time of discovery. Um, and, was, and I was taken by a uh, com compelling account, of what, at least what was compelling to me, an account of what it means to lead one's life well. So, um, I think that's a challenge for us. Challenge for us in a culture which tends to denote that question as insignificant. Challenge to raise it as a fundamental question. Challenge to engage a variety of audiences with that question. And I think probably the more fun, most fundamental side of this question is probably concerns us individually. I was listening once to a lecture by uh, Charles Taylor. You're familiar with Charles Taylor as one of the great contemporary uh, Catholic philosophers. Um, and he was, I don't know, maybe question and answer period or something like that. He was commenting about uh, Mother Teresa and the work that she does. I know Mother Teresa is controversial. My niece will work with her, didn't like it at all. And, you know, so, so all of this, uh, don't bracket it for, for a moment, right? Um, she spends time, she, we used to spend time um, taking care of the refuse of society. There's nobody wanted to take care of. And she was asked once, well, why did you do that? That's now Taylor time. This. And she said, well, I do it because I believe that every human being was created in the image of God. And Taylor says, you know, I could have said that. <laughs> and then reflective and profound philosopher as he is, he added, but could I have meant it? I think in many ways, our challenge is not just to formulate an account of what it means to read one's life. It's also a challenge to really mean, to believe. I'll end with a story. Uh, somebody. Uh, Invariably, people ask me, uh, how have I become an Episcopalian and why? <laughs> my, father was a, my father was a Pentecostal minister. Um, I grew up in that, kind of that, that tradition, and so why Episcopalian, right? And so my answer is uh, twofold. Why? <laughs> <laughs> and God. Uh, why, first. <laughs> Uh, I was, I think, about 20 or so, not quite 21, uh, and I've come to study in this country, in California, and, you know, little did I know about Pentecostalism in this country. I went to one of the churches there, uh, culturally completely uh, shocked. Uh, no, worse was first, first thing I saw, one of the first, first people I saw on TV was Ernst Angley. <laughs> God help us, kind of pulling demons out of people's ears, and I thought, God, where did I live? But at any rate, so I so went to this little Pentecostal, Pentecostal church, and they, were, they, they had that Holy Communion, and they were serving some kind of a platter I'd never seen before, and they had shot glasses uh, all in, in circle <laughs> around, and uh, then when I, when I tasted one of these shot glasses, there was grape juice inside, and I thought, I love shot glasses, but not in church. Any bar would do better than this little, little, little church. I love it. And, and certainly not great, just give me something. <laughs> <laughs> Schlibowitz would be great. Uh, no, no problem with that. And so immediately I asked, where can I get communion in a single cup and why? Uh, we got to go to Episcopalian. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did. <laughs> and the rest is, rest is history. The profound theological reason why I became <laughs> Episcopalian. Right? 
But then the second, second part is probably equally important. Not, maybe not quite as important, but, uh, but, but they are close to uh, And that is that often when I would go to, to various uh, churches, um, I had the impression that they really did not believe in the gospel. If I went to more evangelical churches, then uh, kind of there would be a pop psychology, not just uh, a wrapping of pop psychology. No, no, it was a religious wrapping of pop psychology as the content that was being peddled to me. Was Dr. Phil, in a less eloquent rendition in the church, why would I want something like that? And why is it that we trust Dr. Phil, but can't trust, we, we need so desperately to help this gospel, so that we have to use crutch of Dr. Phil, in order somehow to make it meaningful. Why is it that this gospel isn't caring us? Because maybe we don't believe it. If I went more progressive churches, then uh, Dr. Phil was replaced by Professor Chomsky. <laughs> <laughs> but it's basically the same iteration of the same thing, just from the different, if one is plus, the other one was minus, and uh, you can invert it whichever way you want, I don't care, <laughs> for present purposes. But then again, Rapping was all Christian. You, you, you listen to a sermon and it looks like a Christian, quacks like a Christian, waddles like a Christian sermon, but it ain't a Christian sermon. <laughs> it ain't the gospel. There's something else at the very heart. Um, and then I decided, you know what? I love this Episcopalian, the Episcopalian literature. No matter what the bloke there says in the 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my gospel there, right? And there's no apology for it. Right? And the reason I mention this is kind of a sense of almost lack of faith that the gospel will carry. And we find ourselves in this extraordinary situation where Jesus Christ is this extraordinarily appealing personality, right? And we think we need Dr. Phil's help to make him somehow Jesus Christ. Rather, add to it what I believe that he is the incarnation of the love of God. And I consider it then almost scandalous that we find ourselves unable to raise the question of what it means to flourish and then trust that the jewel placed into our hands will actually serve human flourishing.